Okay, so my ability to attend this uh, event has, was uh, driven by the fact that a year ago I got called for jury duty and uh, one of the things you can do is to put it off by a year. Uh, and so, you know, they say that they can call you every year, but, and they seem to, at least for me, pretty reliably after about 14 or 15 months. But then I learned, well, you can just put it off and you're allowed to put it off by a year. So I just always do that to buy an extra year. And uh, so the upshot of that was that I, you know, picked last Thursday as the day because Thursday's a great day to ask for jury duty because they almost never need a jury on a Thursday. And uh, I, nothing on my calendar was dead clear. And then a few months ago, Meet BSD dropped itself right onto that day. And I'm like, oh, you can't do that. Um, but it was too late. And you're only allowed to shift yourself once, so I couldn't change it. So I, uh, I, I sat, you, know, you call the night before, and they say, well, you don't need you call. I call at 11 to see if we need you in the afternoon. So I called at 11, they didn't need me in the afternoon. Uh, and I thought, great, I'm done. I came down, I was here for the developer summit. And uh, if, they, if they don't make you show up at all on one day, then they get one more day to do it. Well, they, they never panel juries on Friday. So I mean, I knew I was gonna be safe, but I called nevertheless at 5 p.m. And survey says you've got to show up. So Friday morning I showed up and I sat around the jury room and they didn't even try and impanel me. And then in the early afternoon they said, okay, goodbye, thank you. I'm like, Rrr. So uh, I finally sent mail to Denise and said, well, I can be there on Saturday, but I, you know, I have a show I'm seeing up in Berkeley tonight. So I can only be here like for five hours during the day. And she said, no, we'll find a slot for you. It's like, great. What am I supposed to talk about? Oh, whatever you want to talk about. So I said, great, I'll do my history talk. Um, well, I'll do a piece of my history talk. And uh, so the history talk actually, um, there, there's no slides. It's handwritten notes. And there's a little note at the top of the handwritten notes. It says, written on the Indian Pacific train to Perth, January 1986. Because you see, the Indian Pacific runs from Sydney to Perth. It goes all the way across the continent of Australia. It's great because you land in the morning, you mess around during the day, and you get on the train in the early afternoon, and then you have three days before you get to Perth. And uh, so I agreed to give a history talk in, in the uh, Australian Unix users group in Perth, and I figured three days on a train I could do it. So the, the, the writing's a little jumpy as the train's going like this, and I'm trying to write these notes, but uh, that's where it all started. Of course, in 86, there wasn't a lot of history to write because it, you know, only five years in at that point from, well, no, seven years in. Um, but uh, uh, I, I've continued to add to it, so there's more and more and more pages here. And uh, it's actually now a, uh, a four hour lecture. It's actually four hours and two minutes because that turns out to be what the codec will allow you to put onto a single DVD. Um, so obviously I'm not gonna do the whole lecture today. Uh, so this is where I have audience participation uh, opportunity. So there's sort of three components. Um, it, we're gonna ignore modern history. So everything after 4.4 uh, is released. So all you know, the, the modern stuff that you've been hearing about so far today, uh, we're gonna skip over. So you have a choice of one of the three sort of major segments of the, uh, the BSD history at Berkeley. Uh, there's the sort of the early years, so how it all got started, uh, or the middle section, which is the TCP IP wars, where Berkeley had one and BBNN had another, and uh, the, the great debate on which one would go into the system. Uh, or you can have the lawsuit, which is, you know, we finally release open source and uh, AT&T gets grumpy and, and sues. And what ensued after that? Uh, so those are your three choices. You can vote for more than one if you want, but whichever section gets the most votes is what I'll do. Uh, so how many people would like early history? Uh, <laughs> keep your hands up. Okay, 37 votes. Uh, how many people would like the TCP IP wars?
Uh, oh, 27. So no, that one's not going to get it. All right, and the lawsuit. Ooh, 29. All right, so it looks like we're going to do early history. Okay, I, I brought five of these, so anyone that wants to shell out $25 can get the whole thing. It's great if you, like, have a lot of beer and sit down and watch it. Uh, the, the first part of it was done at uh, one of the very early BSD cons, and uh, you'll see that they bring like an entire pitcher of beer and put it right up on the podium at the beginning of the lecture for me, and you see the, the pitcher going down, and the talk gets a little sloppier as it goes along. Uh, all right, so early history. Um, the uh, Sort of the, the earliest of the history really starts in uh, Manchester, England with the Atlas computer. Um, and you know, that, that set a lot of the stage for sort of what an operating system might be on a computer. Um, and uh, uh, can, sort of concurrent with that, uh, Ken Thompson, who was a uh, student at Berkeley, worked on a thing called the Genie Project, uh, which took a lot of the ideas that came out of the Atlas uh, and they were working uh, on a system at Berkeley. Uh, he then graduated and went off to Bell Labs. And uh, Bell Labs, together with General Electric and MIT, were working on an operating system called Multix, which was to run on the GE635, a computer you're all well aware of. I don't think it's supported by NetBSD, one of the few. <laughs> Um, at any rate, uh, the, the problem was that, uh, as with many things that are academic projects, as soon as you sort of get 90% of the way there and you can sort of see that the idea works, you don't actually do the final 90% to make it really work. Uh, you start changing it to do the next cool thing. Uh, so Multix had many of the concepts that we have in our modern operating systems today, um, but it didn't have stability. And the people at the labs really wanted something they could actually use as opposed to a research project. Uh, and so they, uh, they being the Bell Labs, pulled out of the uh, Multix project. And this is where uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie uh, found a PDP-7 sitting around somewhere and said, all right, fine, we're going to do something of our own. Uh, and uh, they started on what would become Unix. Uh, it was really uh, a real time operating system then because they were trying to do space wars and they needed like a small operating system to support that. Um, at any rate, the uh, PDP-7 really wasn't up to the task and they wanted a bigger machine, you know, something like a PDP-11 20, uh, and uh, that required more than they had a budget for. So they needed to find some other department that would be willing to ante up the money. And if we want to find a department that has a lot of money, talk to the legal folks, that is the legal department, and convince them that it's to their best interest to buy a bigger computer for the com computer science people. And uh, so in 1971, uh, they convinced the legal department to put up the money to buy it on the expectation that they were going to put together something to do text processing because of all these legal documents. You know, they wanted something uh, which eventually, well, it started off as Roth, runoff, and then there was the later version of it, which was the new runoff or NROF, uh, and eventually turned into TROF. Uh, at any rate, uh, that got them the computer, and they did eventually get the Roth thing written. Um, it was originally in assembly language, because it was you know, coming across from the PDP-7, which was assembly language, uh, but it got rewritten into C. Uh, there's some debate as to exactly when that was, but it was sort of between versions 3 and 4, as far as I can tell, looking online at the, the sources. Uh, and they presented it at SOSP, the Symposium on Operating System Principles, in 1973. And this caught the attention of a lot of academics who were desperate to get away from punch cards, batch running on large machines. And uh, so one of the people there was Bob Fabry, who was a professor at Berkeley. And uh, because Ken Thompson was also from, had gone to Berkeley, they sort of connected and said, hey, you know, can we get this? And so it came to Berkeley very early on. Uh, and uh, the CS department at Berkeley couldn't afford a, uh, a PDP-11 either, uh, so they got together with the math and stat department 
and uh, to, you know, to, to essentially share this machine. Well, the maths and stat department wanted absolutely nothing to do with this Unix thing. They wanted to run a real operating system. I believe it was Ristis. And uh, so the agreement was that part of the time it would run Ristis and the rest of the time it would run Unix. And of course, you can't just pick the same time slice because either somebody gets prime time during the day uh, and, or not. And so instead what they did is they divided the day into three eight-hour segments. So there was eight to four, four to midnight, midnight to eight. And so Math and Stat wanted it to be running Ristis, so it would do that for 16 hours, and then there'd be eight hours for Unix. And it would move forward by eight hours each day. So, you know, for a day you would have Unix from eight to four, uh, and then you'd get it from four to midnight, and then you'd get it from midnight to eight, and so on and so on, round and round it went. Um, this was really annoying, and so eventually, um, they were finally, the CS department was finally able to get their own PDP 1140 uh, so they could just run it themselves with Unix all the time. Um, they also then were able to, through instructional funds, get themselves their hands on one of these early PDP 1170s, which was the cat's pajamas because it ran at a full one MIP. Um, and uh, that was pretty exciting. Uh, and uh, concurrent with that, um, there were some teething problems getting that to go, uh, but concurrent with that, Ken Thompson had a sabbatical from the labs, and so he came to Berkeley uh, to spend his sabbatical there, and uh, hence was able to help really get the 1170 up and running. Well, in that same year, uh, this gentleman named Bill Joy, who you may have heard of, um, and uh, another student, uh, Haley, uh, they begin you know, working on this and on, on the PDP-11. Uh, Bill had, was working on his PhD in programming languages, which you would probably never have guessed from the design of Seashell. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, the Pascal was going to be the big new language that was going to take the world by storm, and so they basically were working on a Pascal compiler. Um, once Ken left to go back to the labs, uh, Bill kind of took over running the 1170, what we would call a system administrator today. Um, and they, after uh, Ken went back to the labs, they released something called the 50 changes tape, uh, which was you know, a bunch of basically fixes for uh, version 6. And so Bill put that in and that got him going on how the system actually was, the kernel was actually built and compiled and so on, uh, which would lead to what would later become BSD. Uh, meanwhile, he continued work on other things like the EX editor and turned into the VI editor. And so in 1977, he released the first BSD, which of course was just called BSD. It's like rock groups, you know, they call their first album the name of the rock group. And then uh, the second album comes out and then what do you do? Um, at any rate, uh, so the first one was just called BSD. Uh, it had Pascal and the EX editor on it. And uh, it also... Uh, I had a few other little bits and pieces, but that was the primary thing. And he shipped 30 copies of that tape. Uh, the BSD project was Bill Joy. It was the, you know, the show. He put it all together. Uh, he dealt with all the distributions. So I, was, I shared an office with him because we had the same advisor. And there was you know, four desks, four students, and there was one phone in our office. And if it would ring, for whatever reason, it was on my desk. I'd just pick it up and hand it to Bill. I wouldn't even answer. I'd just hand it to Bill because I knew it was for him. And uh, occasionally he'd hand it back to me, but that would be shocking. Um, and he would just say, oh, yeah, send me a tape. I'll send it to you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, OK. Uh, we got addressable terminals there, and that led to things like VI and TermCap. I always said that TermCap was one of the worst things that ever got done because it meant that every single terminal manufacturer could have a different set of escape codes. Uh, otherwise, they would have had to standardize on something reasonable. Uh, at any rate, uh, in 1978, 2BSD got released, uh, and this was basically update to Pascal, the VIEX, uh, and C Shell. Uh, and that was the last of the BSDs that was just a set of utilities that you would add to an existing version 6 system. Uh, 2BSD lived on for many years, uh, leading all the way up to 2.11, uh, which was essentially all of the 
PDP-11 releases. Um, there's more about that story, but not today. Um, at any rate, uh, in 1978, Digital Equipment Corporation releases their first 32-bit machine called the VAX. NetBSD does support the VAX. Uh, and uh, we got a, or, yeah, a pre-release copy of something called 32V, which was just a fast and dirty port of version 7 uh, to the VAX. Uh, and version 7 was the thing that ran on PDP-11. The port was still a swap-based system. It was, didn't utilize any of the paging capability of the VAX. It just uh, did the same thing that PDP-11 did, which is when you needed something, you just loaded the whole thing into physical memory, and when you weren't using it, you could copy it out to swap space. Um, at any rate, uh, the, uh, we, this got brought up on the VAX, but the people that had actually paid for the VAX were the people that were doing something called Vaxima, which was a quadratic equation, or not quadratic, a, a complex uh, equation solving thing written in Lisp. Uh, well, although we had the maximum capacity of memory that you could get on a VAX, which was two megabytes of physical memory, uh, it, with a swap-based system, that meant you really couldn't get more than about one and a half megabytes for a process, assuming you got all of the available memory. And Lisp, even in those days, it was like one megabyte to start it up and get a prompt, and you know, more after that, uh, if you wanted to like actually do something. And so they just couldn't run uh, on, on 32V, and so they insisted that we run VMS, the operating system from DEC, which could make use of the paging hardware. Uh, well, Bill Joy was very upset with this because, of course, we wanted to run Unix. And so over the Christmas holiday, he got together with Ulzat Babgalu, who had written for his thesis a, a, a VM system, and said, let's just get this up and running. And uh, so I happened to be working over Christmas, uh, and the benefit of doing that was the, you know, the machine was much more lightly loaded. And so, but what would happen is it, you'd be running along with 32V, uh, and then there'd be a message saying, okay, shutting down to, to bring up VM Unix. And uh, so you'd get out of everything, and then you know, you'd get the VM Unix prompt, and you'd log in. You'd be working away, working away, and then uh, suddenly you wouldn't be working, and then 32V prompt would come back and more time would pass. But the amount of time where you were running on VM Unix wrote, went up and up and up over time. And by the end of the, of the holiday, uh, which was about the second week of January, it was kind of up and working. Uh, and Bill declared it good enough that this was going to be what was going to be in production. So of course, the Vaxima people jumped on it and just died left and right. But you know, it was a little bit of a struggle. But by the end of January, it was kind of pretty much up and working. And uh, uh, we never looked back. At any rate, uh, the upshot of this is that um, a bunch of other things uh, got added in. Uh, job control got put in, uh, taking the file system, the traditional pre-fast uh, file system, but changing it from 512 byte blocks to 1K blocks, which doubled its throughput, went from utilizing 2% of the disk bandwidth up to 4%. Um, auto reboot, I mean, you just think, what's that? Uh, well, it used to be if the system crashed, you, someone had to sit at the console and fix it. You could, it wouldn't auto reboot itself. Uh, Franz Lisp uh, and the, the precursor to send mail, a thing called deliver mail. Uh, it was like send mail, except that it didn't have a configuration file, it was all compiled in. So you wanted to change anything, you had to recompile and restart it. Uh, at any rate, this got released as 4BSD. Uh, in October of 1980, and 150 copies of this went out. Uh, now this is still Bill Joy that's doing like all of it, you know, the managing it, doing the releases. Well, of course, now we're releasing actual source code that came from AT&T. So naturally, at this point, you know, people have to have a license. So Bill, you know, in the past when he was just giving out utilities, doesn't have to worry about it. But now there's licensing, so. Uh, there's the Bill Joy approach to how you deal with licensing. Hello, oh, you would like to get a copy of 4BSD. Uh, you have a source code license, right? Oh, good. Uh, please, you know, blah, 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 and away it went. Um, well, somebody at the university, you know, we're getting a high enough profile that someone kind of noticed this and said, you know, maybe we ought to do slightly better verification than that. Uh, and 
happily and concurrently, uh, DARPA uh, decides that um, they want to uh, get involved in this Unix thing because they had all these different groups that were using all these different computers and all these different operating systems and all these different languages and they couldn't share stuff at all. And so DARPA wanted to come up with a, a standard hardware, a standard operating system, uh, and a small defined set of languages in the hopes that then people could, they, in one group, could share stuff with people in another group. So they, the first step, hardware. Well, the VAX looks like a good choice. It's 32-bit architecture. It's not super expensive. And uh, you know, a lot of institutions that they care about already have these machines. So then the next step is, well, what's the operating system going to be? Well, the, uh, the choices are VMS or uh, BSD, and uh, they're, they, you know, it's all the usual arguments. A guy named Dave Cashton is, is saying, look, it's got to be VMS. We need a solid operating system with the company behind it so that if things are broken, we have some place we can go and talk to them. You know, doing something that's from Berkeley by a couple of graduate students is like not going to cut it. Uh, and to prove this, he, he wrote a paper and he ran a bunch of benchmarks, what we would call micro benchmarks. How many get PIDs can you do? And, you know, how fast can you send up one byte up and down a pipe, uh, you know, i.e. context switch time, and you know, this sort of thing. And he showed across the board on every one of those benchmarks, VMS ran faster and sometimes like 10x faster than this BSD thing. So I'm sitting in, in, the, in our office when this arrives from DARPA saying, well, you know, do you have any response to this? And Bill just goes ballistic, as Bill does. Uh, and he's like, this is the stupidest thing. Who cares how fast you can do get PID? But if that's what they're going to make their decision on, I'll make that thing run like a bat out of hell. And so over the next 30 days, we just go through and micro-optimize nearly everything. And uh, I mean, you know, literally like looking at the assembly language that comes out from this, this, the C compiler and saying, oh, well, you know, this is, a, you know, put this in a register and, you know, all that kind of nonsense. So we get all the benchmarks working at least as, as well as in VMS and in many cases better because uh, we basically got the system call overhead down below what VMS had do some stupid tricks. And, uh, but we just couldn't get the context switch to, to be even within a factor of two. And uh, so, you know, how to deal with this. And uh, so let's just say uh, there were some discussions that were held with some people at DAC. And anyway, we were walking out of the building, Evans Hall, and uh, there's this delivery truck and this, this box kind of falls off the back of the truck and then he drives off. And so, well, you know, Who's this box addressed to? Well, um, it's not entirely clear on the outside, so we'll take it in and, and we open it up and it's got some microfiche in it. Maybe if we look at the microfiche, it will be clear um, what, who it's supposed to go to. And you know, the very first microfiche we put up was the assembly language for context switch in VMS. <laughs> Don't know how that happened. Anyway, the, the box got appropriately sent off and, and Unsurprisingly, BSD's context switch time was exactly the same speed as VMS's. <laughs> anyway, um, so Bill writes up a, a rebuttal paper saying, these are the stupidest benchmarks I've ever seen, but if that's what you're going to base it on, and then, you know, our report. And then Cashton gets all cranky about that because he can't, like, immediately go fix the same things in VMS. Uh, but the, uh, the upshot is that DARPA decides that it will, in fact, be BSD and that they will fund Berkeley, which means that now Bill can actually have a secretary who can actually do licensing, um, which is good because that turns into a big hoofah. Uh, at any rate, um, meanwhile, this guy named Robert Ells, uh, who you probably have seen, he's uh, part of the NetBSD project, uh, so he's still around, roughly my age. Uh, he did a bunch of things. Um, he did auto configuration. You'd say, well, duh, haven't we always had it? No, actually, before he did that, you had to compile a kernel that exactly matched the hardware that you had. And so, I mean, down to like the number of disks. And, you know, you could, have, let's say you had three disks on your system, if one of them died, you couldn't boot your kernel because it only could find two disks and it would crap out. And so you had to keep a kernel that was compiled with only two disks 
and then you had to know which two it was so you could switch the unit numbers around on the disks to make sure the two it was going to look for were the ones it would find. I'm not making this up. So, at any rate, he did auto configuration, um, and uh, it was far more primitive than what we have today, but uh, nevertheless, it was a very important step. Uh, and he also did a bunch of other tuning, which I'm not going to describe right now. Uh, at any rate, this resulted in 4.1 BSD, which was sort of the first deliverable for DARPA, uh, and was actually delivered, it was supposed to be delivered uh, at the beginning of, in the first quarter of 1981. It didn't actually get out until June of 1981, um, and we were all depressed about it, but DARPA was shocked. Shocked, I tell you, that it came out so fast, because nothing ever happens in less than 2x what they expect. Uh, at any rate, this, this started to be really popular, and about 400 copies of that went out. Uh, and just to keep things in context here, um, this is when System 3 is released in early 1981. Um, and uh, that, that also combined with, uh, brought in uh, what they had for uh, version 7, but PWB and uh, uh, some of the other uh, USG uh, software. So, uh, in essence, what had happened was that the descent decree uh, which had been signed in 1956, which said IBM would only do computers and AT&T would only do phones. Um, that got evaporated so that AT&T could, in fact, start doing computers if they wanted. Uh, it also meant that eventually led to their breakup, um, which they didn't like, but they started selling Unix, and System 3 was the first one that they were shipping. Okay, so DARPA is like so shocked and amazed that like Berkeley actually did something on like a real schedule. Uh, they said, okay, well that worked really well, we're going to give you another grant, and uh, this time we want to get networking into the system. And so, uh, you know, it's like, okay, that's great, um, but of course you can't trust graduate students to actually implement networking, so we're going to give you the unimportant part. Uh, you, you're just going to do the, the interface for it, the, the application interface for uh, the networking, and the actual networking is going to be done by BBNN, both Bermick and Newman, uh, because they're a long-time DARPA contractor and we know they really know how to write real software. Now, you don't trust the graduate students to write TCP IP, but you do trust them to design the interface that's going to be used. I mean, come on. Uh, but, you know, Bill's like, cool, you know, we get someone else to do the grunt work and we get to do the fun stuff, and so he designed the socket interface. And, you know, it's like, like so many other things that Bill does, it, you know, was, he had, he had a vision and he actually, you know, was able to articulate it pretty well. He didn't get it quite right. Uh, I don't know if I'll get far enough to explain the, the, the slight bumps in it, but sure enough, he got it designed, he got it done. Um, and Bill, Bill's a really amazing person if you haven't ever had a chance to meet with him. Uh, someone once asked, than me to compare myself to Bill Joy. And I said, well, you know, there's really nothing that Bill has done that I couldn't have done, but what Bill would do in a month would take me a year. Um, he, he had like an idea, he wanted to get from here to there, he figured out absolutely the shortest path from here to there, and he got there and it worked. Now, if you want to change it, no chance. I mean, it was just like hack, 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 and you'd make one little change and the whole thing would just collapse in a puddle. So you've spent a great deal of time getting it into a state where you could then move it forward. Um, but, you know, his vision was great. Um, they, they, there's a great talk by John Mashey called Software Army on the March. And he talks about the different kinds of people that you need to do software development. And he says, you start out with the scouts. You're, you're trying to build, you know, a road through the through the jungle to get to some place. You start out with the scouts on, with machetes and, and motorcycles, and they just sort of you know, hack through there and, and say, oh, no, 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 there's a huge cliff there, that won't work, you know. They kind of find a route, and it's nothing more than like, you know, a path wide enough for a motorcycle to go on. Uh, so, and so then, once you get that done, um, then, you, then you bring in the, uh, the you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, and they, they start like, you know, actually cutting down the trees and paving the roads, you know, and then you finally bring in the, the, the last set of people, you know, and they do the sidewalks and the street lights and the signs and all those kinds of things. So Bill Joy was the, the scout. I mean, he was out there with the machete on the motorcycle finding a route. 
you know, and then there was myself, and I was kind of, you know, turned it into roads, and then Mike Carls came along, and he's the one that, you know, made sure there were, like, sidewalks and streetlights and all the rest of it. Uh, so we each had our little part in this, and uh, we worked pretty well as a team, uh, as long as, you know, each of us understood sort of what we were doing and didn't get too upset by what the other people were doing. Um, so, like, Mike had trouble working directly from Bill's stuff, but he could work great with, you know, where I would get it to. Okay, so... Meanwhile, Bill gets the socket stuff done, the user interface, and uh, so then BBNN is supposed to do the TCP IP, and uh, while all this is going on, uh, Bill writes the 4.2 architecture manual, uh, which defines the whole socket interface. It also defined like MMAP and all these other things that didn't get done for another decade, but never mind. Um, and uh, so Bill, you know, he hacks up the socket interface and he's ready to try it, but he needs some TCP IP code. And so he goes to Rob Gurowitz, who's the person that's leading the charge at BBNN, and says, well, I, I you know, I'm, I'm ready for the TCP IP code, you know, can I get something? And uh, well, Gurowitz says, well, you know, we, we barely have a prototype running yet, you know, there's a lot that still needs to be done on it. Um, but there's enough of it, you know, that I, I, you know, I can give you what I've got, uh, and it, it, you know, it works, but you know, it'll be another year before it's really finished. Bill says, that's fine, that's fine, uh, no problem. So he gets the BBNN code, and he drops it in. Well, the DARPA backbone at that point was uh, 50 kilobit dedicated links. And uh, at the time, we, were, we had uh, VAX 1180s, which were the big honk and one MIP machines. And then we had the smaller things that were sort of the size of a washing machine called the VAX 750. And it ran at about 0 0.7 MIPS. Um, and that's what we had for our testing at that point. And so when we brought it up, running this TCP between two 750s, it could get 50 megab or megabits, kilobits, uh, even though we were running on the latest fancy uh, thing called Ethernet that we'd gotten from Xerox Park that had the ability to run at three megabits. Uh, but even though we had a three megabit link, we could only get 50 kilobits across it with 100% CPU saturation on the VAC 750. And Bill goes, what in the heck is this code doing? Well, of course, it was well-structured code. You know, there's the state machine in, in TCP IP, and each state had its own module, and you went through these links and steps, and, you know. And Bill's like, well, that's ridiculous. No wonder it's taking so long. Hack, hack, hack. So all those modules got put together in one giant TCP input and one giant TCP output. And places where there'd been uh, subroutine calls were just go to. For the longest time, there was still, you know, go to state six uh, was one of the ones that didn't get removed for a very long time. Anyway, you know, hack, 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 patch, 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 getting rid of various and sundry other stupid stuff. Those are Bill's words, not mine. Uh, and uh, by golly, we got it to the point where we could run at three megabit from 750 to 750 and still have 10% CPU left over to run your user application. <laughs> and uh, so th this was, you know, considered a great breakthrough. And uh, we were, the next release that we were going to have was going to be 4.2, but we decided that, you know, there was enough demand that we re that people, you know, they wanted the networking. So we released something called 4.1a. Uh, and that came out in uh, April of 1982. Uh, so at this point, Sam Leffler joins the group, uh, and he begins to uh, help Bill with a rewrite of the networking uh, code, mostly the interface, because uh, Sam actually knew something about networking. And he pointed out to Bill um, that the accept system call, as Bill had it designed, you do an accept, and you, you, know, you had your rendezvous socket, or, well, you had your socket, you do an accept on it, and it would now be connected to the other end. And it was then dedicated to, you know, SMTP or whatever it was until that was finished. And then you could, you know, use it again for your next connection. Well, that meant you could only have one of any given service, one instance of any given service running at any point in time. And it was pointed out, you know, it might be that two people would want to send mail to your machine at the same time, if you could imagine that. And so Sam is the one that revved the accept system call so that it would return a new socket, uh, which is the way it is today. 
so that you could just do loop in an accept loop and get lots of, of connected sockets. Uh, and he also added the listen system call because obviously that then became necessary. Uh, and though that was mainly the main additions that he made, also getting rid of IOCTL and adding get and set sock opt. Um, in fact, I was lobbying to say, you know, let's just get rid of IOCTL and just, you know, make everything in that get and set sock opt mode. I, I lost that argument because it was way too big of an installed base. Uh, Sometimes, you know, people say, you know, if you had a time machine and you could go back in time, you know, people, I want to put an E on Creat. What the heck would E on Creat? You know, I'd like to get rid of IOCTL. Um, we had the big debate when we went from NCP to TCP, should it be a 32-bit address or a 48-bit address? We were lobbying for 48 bits, but we lost. Uh, we wouldn't have the whole V6 thing today, I suspect, if we had gone to 48, but all right. Um, Anyhow, uh, so Sam comes in and uh, meanwhile, another story that uh, was how I got sucked into doing the file system, which I won't go through now, uh, but I was writing the fast file system and I got that to the point where it was usable. Usable means I was going to put my home directory on it uh, without any other backup copies other than backup tapes. Um, and uh, so that was actually released as 4.1b. That came out in June of uh, 1982, so just a couple of months after the 4.1a. Um, and then Sam and, and Bill uh, do a revised uh, networking uh, and they add the, you know, some, some more of the inter-process communication stuff like the ability to pass sockets back and forth. Uh, and uh, also the code for the first time got divided up into sort of machine dependent and machine independent. Up to that point it was all kind of a big mishmash. Uh, and it wasn't clear to me exactly why it was that uh, Bill suddenly found this to be such an important thing to do uh, until one day I come walking into his office and he says, uh, come my friend, so I'm, I'm getting ready to start this company called Sun Microsystems and we're going to build, you know, on commodity hardware 68,000 and we're going to use, you know, this uh, Unix commodity software and uh, we're just going to take the, you know, the workstation market by storm. Well, I had just finished getting my master's of science degree in the business school at Berkeley. And so, you know, I, I'd taken like marketing and finance and uh, entrepreneurship and all these different courses. And so I knew a few things about things. And I said, you know, Bill, people really don't care what the hardware is. They really don't care what the software is. You know, they, it's the applications and Apollo it's a three-year jump on Sun, and they've got all the CAD CAM, which are like the big application space for workstations. So, you know, I just really don't see how this Sun thing is going to work. So, no, I'm not going to come with you to Sun. We'll see, you know, I'll finish my PhD in another 12 months. We'll see how it's going. Um, so don't take any advice to me about business stuff. If you want to start a business, <laughs> ask somebody else. <laughs> But otherwise, I'd be so rich, I'd have an island somewhere and I wouldn't be here. No, I probably would still be here. Um, at any rate, um, uh, Bill goes off to, to start uh, Sun and uh, the, you know, the last piece that was supposed to be uh, in 4.2 uh, was to be the virtual memory system, the whole MMAP stuff. And uh, Bill said, oh yeah, well even after I go to Sun, you know, I'll make sure that, you know, that gets finished up. But uh, uh, didn't. So, uh, and at some point we just decide, well, you know, it's time to get something out the door because, uh, you know, we actually had uh, promised. And um, so, meanwhile, this is when uh, Mike Carls comes and joins the group because, you know, Bill is gone and uh, we need you know, more people, more hands on deck. And so, uh, he, he joined in June of 1983 and really helped with just getting the final polishing on 4.2 which got released in uh, August of 1983. Uh, and this was a thousand copies that got sent out. And you know, this, a, a copy, remember, is like the whole, you know, one copy goes to an institution. You know, a company gets one copy, a university gets one copy, uh, and so this was just really almost at the peak of, of BSD because any, almost anyone that had a VAX, your choice was, let's see, system three with the networking is something called UUCP, or would you prefer something that actually, you know, works on the internet, uh, or ARPANET at that point, because the internet didn't really exist yet. Uh, 
And uh, so in response to this, uh, AT&T releases System 5 Release 1. Uh, okay, so uh, this is essentially where I, I, I'll cut off now because I was supposed to stop five minutes ago actually. Um, but uh, th the next phase of this history is where BBN uh, notices that the TCP IP that we had put in wasn't the final version they'd sent us, but the crappy old version. Uh, and not only was it the crappy old version, but it had been hacked beyond recognition. Uh, and uh, so they uh, began agitating uh, that it get replaced with the nice, clean, wonderful copy that they had, or version that they had done. Um, but that leads into the whole TCP IP wars, uh, and I'm not going to try and tell that part of the story. So I will close there and uh, take any questions that people have. Now, this group is not great at questions. Yes, okay. So um, could you comment on the level of community contribution in the early 80s? You mentioned Robert Elves. How much of the architecture and feature set was internal to Berkeley, and how much came from outside? All right, so the, the, the question is, actually an excellent one, is community. How much came from inside Berkeley, and how much came from outside? Uh, the Berkeley group at its peak had four technical people in it. Uh, and during the part period that I'm talking about, it had two that were sort of full time. Uh, so really what the people at Berkeley were doing was primarily coordinating stuff that was coming from the outside world, even at that point in time. Um, with the advent of, of 4.1a, uh, we were up on the ARPANET. And so um, before that time, people uh, had to send their stuff uh, usually on tape. And so we would get it and, and load it in and uh, you know, incorporate it into the system. Uh, and in one, words of one of our contributors, pee on it to make it smell like Berkeley. Uh, at any rate, uh, <laughs> we were just making it consistent, you have to understand. Uh, at any rate, uh, we had really only started using source code control in 1980, which is when SCCS became available. And that started out as being just the operating system, and, and I started spreading it around to uh, get all the utilities, because we didn't even know where the source code was for a bunch of the utilities. Um, and so it wasn't really until 4.2, the release of 4.2, that we had everything uh, under uh, source code control. But uh, it sort of commensurate with being, bringing up uh, 4.1a, getting up on the ARPANET, it then meant that we could start allowing select people to log in and do things directly themselves. And because we had the source code control system, uh, essentially if you had a login account, you were allowed to commit. Uh, you'd be a committer today by that definition. Uh, but the thing was that the, the changes were not so great that, um, you know, it was, that we couldn't keep track of what was going on. So before each release, uh, we would print out a diff basically of everything since the last release. Uh, and it was printed out on, you know, fan fold paper and it was about that thick. And Bill Joy would, he would do the things he wanted to do, but like the Pascal compiler, all the diffs that he'd just hand to me and say, here, check this. Uh, or like the, the uh, VM code, he would often get like Olsop or something like that to look at that. But every single line of diff between the releases would looked at by one of us at Berkeley uh, just to, you know, make sure that weird stuff hadn't snuck in. Um, we also would coordinate things, so there'd be people working on, let's say, diff and patch, and, you know, the change to diff meant that patch would barf, uh, or a change to patch, you know, would have some other thing. And so we would essentially, you know, say, you know, diff author, patch author, they don't work. The two of you work this out and make it work, and we don't care whether you change diff or patch, but it has to work. And so it was that level of coordination. So the real answer to your question is, I would say, probably 90% of what we were doing came from outside of Berkeley. We had about, oh, well, initially maybe 10 people that we gave accounts to on the machine, and at the peak there were probably about 50 maybe that would have accounts. Uh, but they, of course, would then be coordinating in their institution, because it usually would be like one person at a university, like Robert. Uh, uh, and uh, 
he, you know, he would coordinate with other changes that other people in the department were making and would bring that together and he would be the one that would be then committing it. And you could look and see who committed something that, you know, if you didn't understand it, then you'd go to Robert and Robert would say, oh, I need to talk to, you know, so-and-so and he would come back with an answer. Um, and so that model w was started actually rather early on and really that carried over into the model that's used by most of the BSDs today. Uh, you know, obviously things are done at a much bigger scale today with many more people, uh, you know, 400 committers and thousands really developers, uh, especially when you take ports into consideration. So uh, I would say that, that that external development model started very early on, which is sort of a long answer to a short question. Yes, George. I'm actually going to watch the mic since I apologize. <laughs> um, so two questions. The number of people that access, does that include all of us who used RMS's account? <laughs> <laughs> just, just checking. That's so, all so, uh, uh, RMS, uh, I assume everyone knows who RMS is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, at any rate, uh, he, he had a habit of like showing up and just taking over somebody's desk and doing stuff for a while. Uh, and we didn't have a lot of extra desks. In fact, we didn't have any extra desks. And so uh, this, this was kind of an annoyance. But he, he managed to hang out for a couple weeks at Berkeley and got his account. And um, you know, we required that you have a password on the account. Um, but uh, he started out with one on the account, but unbeknownst to us, managed to uh, uh, rewrite the password command so that it would allow a null password uh, and put in a null password and then, you know, not keep that version of it around. Uh, and so there was actually a period of uh, about two months uh, where we started seeing RMS commits uh, and uh, uh, we were curious, so we sent some mail to Robert uh, and uh, He'd say, you know, what, what the heck's going on here? What are you doing? Why are you, you know, making changes in like, the, all these weird places? Uh, and uh, got no answer from him. And then someone pointed out, well, you know, there's no password on his account. And like, and turned it off. Uh, which then, that got a response out of him. So there was a lot of back and forth on that. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, we caught it fairly early on and uh, backed out any of the things that didn't seem appropriate, which was uh, most of them. <laughs> Uh, including one which was a, a back trap door to get into the kernel. <laughs> and the other question is, how long did it take to build the world? How long did it take to build the world? Well, uh, on the VAC 750, uh, it took 24 hours. Uh, and uh, that was when the, the new version of GCC came out. I think it was version 2, maybe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know why it is that compilers seem to take like, you know, 40% of the total make world time. But it became true with GCC version 2, and it seems to have more or less stayed the same ever since. 85% <laughs> Sorry? 85% now. 85% now. OK, well, I can it's stop complaining. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I felt like BSD was a war at GCC, so you know that that really hasn't changed. I guess it's just the size of the wart, you know, shrunk slightly. Yeah, well, you know, I, I hate to admit that my PhD is in fact in in uh, programming languages, so I'm at least you know somewhat to blame for some of these things. But uh, you know, I, I climbed up the food chain. I, you know, I started my career as electrical engineering, designing you know, digital hardware, and then I discovered. Uh, microprocessors and microcode and which is really assembly language and so when I went to do my PhD I wanted to do it on assembly language but you can't really do that uh, even back in the 80s and so compilers was the next best choice because then you could write a program that wrote assembly language um, and then I got sucked into the operating system by Bill and so I left the compilers behind and have been doing operating systems and I suppose I should have continued climbing up the food chain you know I could have gotten into Windows systems and then applications I could be a PHP program Grammar today, but somehow I'm still stuck on C in the Combot operating system. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, I think it's nearly like time for the next speaker to start, so I will leave it there. And uh, thank you very much.